you shall have no other gods before me. Uh, let's talk about a polytheism, monolatry, monotheism uh, within the book of Deuteronomy in particular, within Torah, uh, within the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh. So Deuteronomy uh, opens uh, back in chapter 5 with this statement, which you know, should be familiar, I think, to people, like well, at least people familiar with the Bible or something, that, you know, that God says you should have no other gods before me. Now, the deal there, right, I think the, the, the reasoning, the rationale is that such a stipulation wouldn't make sense should there not be other gods uh, competing, <laughs> right, for attention and loyalty, etc. So have no other gods before me kind of just presupposes the existence of other gods. So when we're talking about things like, you know, monotheism versus monolatry, etc., which is, a, I mean, this is an interesting and I think good topic uh, in the Bible, generally, um, I would apply this within the Christian scriptures uh, to some conversations about whether or not Jesus uh, is the divine agent of God. And the divine agent uh, oftentimes is imbued with the authority and the powers of the one who sent the agent. So there's a lot going on here about uh, divine beings and powers and things like this. Okay, so I think the, uh, the Christian scriptures are not immune from such critical thinking about you know, monotheism, polytheism, monolatry, like these things. Uh, but I'm in particular want to focus on Torah right now, and in particular want to focus on uh, this week's Parsha. Uh, well, in particular, Nitzavim, um, which is uh, from like Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter, like, oh, picks up in 28 or 29 or something, and goes through 31, I think, something like that. Like, there's a roundabout. Chapters 28 to 31 is roundabout what we're talking about within Deuteronomy, but within Deuteronomy on a more macro view. That's really what I want to focus on, uh, that kind of perspective here. So when we talk about monotheism, uh, I think monotheism largely is the belief that like, well, there's one God, uh, mono, one, <laughs> one deity, one God. Uh, and I think a lot of people think, oh yeah, well, the monotheism is like an invention of the Bible and, you know, weren't they monotheists in the Bible or something like this? And there are some canonical Jewish prayers. I mean, the Shema, Shema Yisrael, this uh, calls us to, uh, the God is first among the gods. People will say, well, the God alone, does this mean there's only one God? Is this a declaration of monotheism? Well, uh, it only claims that God uh, is the first among all the gods, that we worship Adonai as the one God, as the first God, as the prime God, as the principal God, as the most important God, as the sovereign God, whatever it may be. Monolatry is the idea that allows for the existence of other gods, uh, but monolatry, there's one God who's supreme, who's chief, uh, and that is the worldview of the Torah, uh, the book of Deuteronomy, uh, and the Deuteronomistic uh, history uh, as well in Chronicles. Uh, in Deuteronomy and in Chronicles, we get some, uh, some discussion about the divine assembly, the divine council, the assembly of El. <laughs> so El, Elyon, Elohim. These are other names for other gods. This is, gets complicated historically. Uh, but that God is seen as the supreme God over a divine council. That's the Deuteronomistic historian's view of things. Now, later into the Second Temple period, we trend toward more of a straight-up monotheism. Um, but in Deuteronomy, in Parsha Nitzavim, which is the Parsha assigned for this week, uh, Nitzavim and Vayelach, but I have not been talking much about Vayelach in the videos I've been making this week. I've been talking more about Nitzavim. I just happen to think there's really interesting stuff within that particular portion. Um, so Deuteronomy opens back in chapter 5 with, you shall have no other gods before me, right? So this is this expression of monolatry of like, there are lots of gods, but the God of Israel is our God. He's our number one. Uh, he's our dude. Uh, yes, I'm using gendered masculine pronouns there. Uh, that is some because I'm being a little careless. Uh, others because that's sort of some of the language reflected reflected within the the, the Hebrew itself. Um, of course, uh, God is genderless. Should there be a God? <laughs> it seems to me the God would be a genderless sort of a thing. Uh, the God would be no gender or all genders or something like this. Uh, but that's for theology, and I don't do theology. Uh, I do Bible, not theology. So uh, chapter 5 opens, you should have no other gods before me. Um, and then uh, later in the text, chapter 29, 29, 25, I've been writing about this. So these these chapters or verses are kind of on my mind a little bit because I've been writing about this this week. If you're a subscriber to Chitzonim, my Parsha post will finally come out at some point today. Let's make a commitment before 4 p.m. Eastern today. <laughs> I will publish the post. Uh, so maybe you can read it on Shabbat. Ah, how perfect. Uh, it's supposed to be this way all along. So uh, in, in chapter 29, verse 25, there's this uh, description of other people um, who followed other gods not allotted to them. Now, I think that this matters. And I talk about this in the, in the post I'm working on. 
So we need to understand this, this view here, right? So, the, so don't be like there are other people who worshiped other gods they did not experience and were not allotted to them. So the plot thickens here a little bit. So not only are we allowing for the existence of other gods with God being Adonai, the God of Israel, being the supreme God of the council of other divine beings or of other gods or the assembly of El, or it's like, if you look in Psalm 82, you get some of this language as well. So it's like in Deuteronomy Chronicles, Psalm 82, there's some like key places here where you've got divine counsel, you've got God as supreme, you've got God as uh, others standing in judgment of God, uh, etc. So in chapter 29, 25, uh, chapter 29, verse 25, there's these other people. And so this idea about worshiping gods that are not allotted to them, we have to understand the worldview is that for every people, there's a God and there's a land. You've got an allotment. Here's your God. Here's your people. Here's your family, your tribe. Here's your land. Like that's a package in the kind of ancient Southwest Asian worldview uh, that we're talking about in the sort of broad Canaanite religious tradition generally, which includes ancient Israel. Um, but, you know, I mean, there's a lot of shared ideas and traditions among the Ugaritic texts and some of the ancient uh, texts of Israel, etc. There's a lot of overlap here. There's a lot of sharing of cultural exchange of ideas, uh, etc. And so uh, a person uh, lives within this kind of package of like your tribe, your family, your land or geography, and then your God. Like that's a whole complete thing that you've got. And so Deuteronomy at chapter 29, verse 25 is concerned about these other people that worship gods that weren't their gods. They weren't part of their allotment. They were in other people's allotment. They didn't experience gods who they didn't experience and weren't part of their allotment. So this helps us to draw uh, into relief what the covenant uh, in Deuteronomy is really about. This covenant, uh, and that's what, so Deuteronomy generally is all about this covenant. The covenant is a big deal. Chapters 12 to 26 are the core material of a covenant between the people and the Holy One. That's what Deuteronomy is about and it has a bunch of stuff built around it. But the covenant, what, what I think I want us to really understand is that I think so often we're, we're, we're quick to just like go into like contemporary thinking about these things. Like, oh, well, yeah, okay, so you're pledging some sort of allegiance, oath of loyalty to God. That's kind of like, maybe it's like a statement of faith. Uh, maybe somebody from a Christian apologetic tradition might think. Um, you know, or maybe it is like uh, declaring, you know, core central liturgy, like the Shema or something like this. Maybe this is what these people were doing. Uh, and I think there's a gulf between the religious practice of the ancients and our religion, religious practice. Now, I think within Judaism, and I, I mean, I try to unpack this a little bit in my writing. Um, I mean, I think... I love the idea. I'm, I'm, I'm in love with this romantic ideal that there's a traditionalist line that connects us, right? That like, uh, and I write this line in the post where I'm like, a, you know, you see a little boy with peyote over there and you think like some of them in the 6th century BCE are in us right now, right? You see a man wearing tzitzit and you're like, oh, well, the garment is discussed in Deuteronomy. So there's some of the 6th century BCE in us today. I think that's a really romantic ideal that I really love. And I think that, I mean, if you're a Jew like me, um, I'm drawn towards that traditionalism. Like I sort like it's funny. Like I, I would almost rather be like a fedora wearing black uh, coat, white shirt guy. I think I'd look good like that. <laughs> There's a part of me that wants that, right? Even though that's a very like Ashkenaz, Eastern Europe sort of you know idea, right? It captures this essence of traditionalism that connects us to these Deuteronomistic people. Uh, I just think that there's a wider gulf than we uh, sometimes like to admit uh, there. What these folk were doing <laughs> in Deuteronomy, they're standing before God in judgment to enter a covenant that is their allotment of their family, their tribe, their God, and the land they're about to enter at the end of Deuteronomy. So I just wanted to like talk some about this idea of other gods and of people's allotment and what the covenant meant. Uh, on the precipice of entering the land, which is what Parsha Nitzavim, uh, that's the setting uh, for Parsha Nitzavim. I made a video about it yesterday. There's another video uh, uh, about it today. And uh, like I say, the post will be coming uh, eventually after I check the work email and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a hobby practice, y'all. Uh, okay, much love. If, if I don't hear from you or you don't hear from me, Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>